Okay, I am very excited that tomorrow is spring, so I am wearing as bright clothing as I possibly can to make the great clouds go away. Um, welcome to all of you, both here inside and to all of the many of you that are watching on Zoom. It's very, very nice to have us together again. I will be serving as your worship associate, and my name is Linda Gianelli Pratt. Be careful, Linda. <laughs> um, our guest speaker today is Reverend Tanya Marquez, and she is a community minister, spiritual director, and hospice chaplain currently working at Sharp Memorial Hospital. She believes in the healing power of words, ritual, and community and her ministry is influenced by her migrant and frontezera. Fronteriza. Fronteriza, from the borderland. From the, her experience from the borderland. Thank you, thank you. So, welcome to all of you to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Diego. This is the place where we come to find support and connection. This is the place where we search for life's meaning. And this is the place where we encourage each other to live our lives with compassion, consistent with our seven principles. This is the place where we put value, our value, into action. Whatever your age, ability, race, ethnicity, gender, identity, sexual orientation, economic circumstance, <clears throat> family structure, or any other identity, this is a place where you are welcome. This is a place where we practice unconditional love. You can find more details, if you're curious about this, at our website, uufsd.org. If you are visiting today for the first time and feel comfortable introducing yourself, I ask that you raise your hand and then we will, if you're willing, uh, allow you to briefly introduce yourself by saying your name and where you're from. Someone will bring a microphone to you so, uh, so that those online can hear you. Is there, are there any visitors today? Visitors? Visitors, yes, hello, hello. Please stand if you're willing. One moment while the microphone comes. Okay. Hi, my name is Liza Douglas, and I live in Forest Ranch. Oh, lovely. That's close to me. Welcome. <laughs> um, my name is Nicole Ventrone, and I'm Liza's sister. And we joined today because it's kind of halfway, well, same distance to get here. I live in La Mesa. Awesome. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Welcome to yeah. both of you. Any other visitors that feel? Yes, look way over there. Way. Run like the wind. Hi, 
everyone, my name is Autumn and I'm coming here from Rancho Bernardo. We're neighbors. Hi, I'm Ashley Hahn and I'm coming from Miramisa. Very nice, very nice. Welcome to you both. Are there other ones? We're pointing, people are pointing? Okay, I'm not pointing, I'm not even looking. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for your introductions. We appreciate it. Um, if you have been attending UUFSD for a while and might be ready to learn more about us, the UUFSD orientation class this Sunday is this Sunday after the service and has lots of information to share. So if you're interested in joining UUFSD, this class is a must as you really ought to know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> Betsy wrote this, not me. <laughs> there is a luncheon after the service and I thought we might sit at the table in the back of the core area, which is over there, for the class while we chow down. All right, so now I invite all of you to take a minute or two to say hello to those around you and let us give an especially warm welcome to our visitors and newcomers. Katie will play a chord when you're supposed to come back together again. Please stand in body or spirit to sing our opening hymn, our gathering hymn. Wow, that was so good. Thank you. Um, singing hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses. Receive 
how wonderful it is that we are here, here on this planet, here in this sanctuary, here in the company of one another. Let us leave the to-do list at the door. Let us bring back our spirits from past thoughts and from future plans. Allow roots to grow from the softness of your body to ground you here. And receive each breath as the miraculous gift of life it is. Awaken your senses. Let us worship together. I would like to invite John Host to come forward with a lovely testimonial. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to share this testimonial to the congregation today. My name is John Host, uh, and I use he and him pronouns. I am recently joined member of UUFSD, along with our two children, Everett and Tabitha, and my wife, Emily. Uh, Tabitha is the little one who sometimes runs up and down the steps outside. <laughs> um, we are grateful to Susan and the other members of this congregation who have volunteered their time on Sundays to spend with our children. We started attending services during the summer with a primary interest of introducing our son to religious education and spiritual development. Uh, we found that while his world was full of football, Mario Kart, and BattleBots, the big hairy questions of what makes a good person, how to live with purpose, and what do we owe to each other didn't seem to make it to our regular dinner conversations. Uh, as stereotypical millennials, neither Emily or I had attended church since the 1990s. And um, <laughs> when we were initially discussing options for a religious experience, I recommended that we seek out UU congregations near to our home in Oceanside. I myself grew up UU and attended preschool at first UU in Hillcrest, and later as a teenager, Orange Coast Church in Costa Mesa. I had a very positive experience and an overall affinity with religious education, including several summers and winters spent at Camp de Beneville. I, I sold Emily on my childhood experience, running through the hallways and grounds of the congregation, learning about Native American storytelling traditions, auditioning for bit roles in our semi-annual plays, making meals for folks living with HIV and AIDS, and hunting for Easter eggs in the canyon behind our church. As a teenager, I took coordinated trips to neighboring institutions of faith, a Quaker community, a mosque, a synagogue, and a Buddhist temple. We searched for and discussed the commonalities in our religions, while respecting and honoring the differences. It became all very normal for me to expect that a group of people could hold different fundamental beliefs and still share the same sets of values. And so Emily and I decided to try to find that type of environment for our family. When we first attended UUFSD, we were drawn in by the beauty and tranquility of the outdoor setting, the kindness of the community, and the gentleness of the rituals. We noted that we seemed to have joined at the tail end of a difficult transition for the congregation, and we were sensitive to that history and experience. We were heartened to learn that so many here have engaged in sometimes difficult conversations about structural racism through the eighth principle, and we noted that we were one of a handful of young families, which me would mean our children wouldn't necessarily have the same robust RE experience that I did, but we also figured we could be part of some new beginnings and all that as a measure of good faith. Everett was initially very reluctant to come, <laughs> and he required quite a bit of coaxing. On our drives in, we play a podcast called Big Life for Little Kids. That helps him, excuse me, that helps put him in the right mindset to participate in some of the intergenerational readings and RE lessons. Over time, as he, had made, as he has made friends and grown more comfortable, he has quit whining on Sunday mornings and now mostly looks forward to it. <laughs> he seems to especially enjoy the singing. Uh, the last Sunday, or a few Sundays ago, I heard his voice rise above all others while singing our centering hymn, and it brought me tears of joy. For Emily and I, while we weren't necessarily thinking first about community and fellowship, 
while dipping in our toes, we have, found, we have found that that too has been an unexpected blessing and years of feeling somewhat anxious and isolated from the broader community. Excuse me. <laughs> but we thank you for welcoming us and are proud to join you in pledging a sustaining commitment to this congregation. Thank you. John and family, thank you so much. That was obviously very heartfelt, so thank you. I'd like to now invite Angie to come on up. She is our board president, and she has a brief announcement. Good morning, and thank you, John. I just wanted to take a moment and highlight that the board has increased our pledge goal to $350,000. You might have seen a, a note in the open letter from the board went out Thursday, a little article in the newsletter that went out Friday. This is about a 5% increase over our pledge income for this fiscal year. And as most of you are probably aware, we have not been able to fill our open position for an RE coordinator this past year. But reaching this goal would give us so much more flexibility in being able to hire a quality professional RE person. Having had both of my, our sons, I'm now 32 and 35, grow up in the RE program at this fellowship, I know how valuable, informative of an experience that was for them. Our RE volunteers have been doing a fabulous job this year, but how wonderful it would be if they had a trained professional leading their effort. Attracting young RE families into our community is absolutely critical for the well-being and viability of UUFSD, and I would say for the larger world as well. Our goal this year would be to offer an attractive half-time position, and being able to do that depends on the success of our current pledge goal, that a pledge drive that goes until April 2nd. Thank you. We honor the continuing presence of the Kumeyaay Nation here in San Diego County. May we respect and honor this land and all of nature to ensure that our grandchildren and future generations can enjoy our sanctuary. May we be as one and live as one. Amen. The Unitarian Universalist Flaming Chalice represents our shared history, hope, and commitment to the principles of our faith that join us together. <clears throat> Those of you at home are now invited to join us in lighting a chalice or candle, holding it up to your camera so that we can share our light together. May its light reminds us of the warmth of this community. May, may it illuminate our time here and the sacred space we create in our coming together. Now please rise in body or <clears throat> in spirit and join us in singing our centering hymn, Spirit of Life, followed by reciting our covenant.
join me in reciting the Fellowship Covenant. May love be the spirit of this congregation. May this quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our covenant. You may be seated. I now invite all the little ones to either sit on the floor or sit on those front seats so you don't have to sit on the floor because I'm not sitting on the floor. So come and join us in a... This is a beautiful new book that was recommended by Reverend Tanya and I just had a chance to look at it and the pictures are absolutely stunning and it'd be great if you were close enough to see them. <laughs> the name of this book is called I Wonder. I Wonder. Am I a little too close, maybe? Let's see. Eva loves to look at the moon. It follows her from place to place, disappearing behind trees and mountains, and then appearing again someplace new. Look, Mama, there it is. The moon looks so beautiful in the sky. How do you think it follows us, Eva? Do you know? Do you know? <laughs> Eva thinks about it, but she just can't figure it out. It's okay to say, I don't know, says her mother. When we don't know something, we get to wonder about it. I wonder if the moon and the earth are friends, said Eva. Her mother smiles. I like that idea. Look at that beautiful picture. Isn't that, don't you want to get closer? <laughs> you see it? There you go. All right. But Mama, how does the moon really stay close to us? There is an invisible force called gravity that puts all the things in the universe together, Eva's mother explains. Gravity keeps the moon close to the earth, and it keeps the planets close to the sun, too. They circle around like this. Eva understands a little better, but then she starts to wonder, Mama, where does gravity come from? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I know it is. I like you. You're good. Good. Okay. I don't know, Eva. Nobody really knows for sure. But, well, some of us know. And when, and when no one knows the answer to something, it's called a mystery. A mystery is something for everyone to wonder about together. How fun! Eva imagines herself wandering about gravity together with all the people of the world. Look at that, wandering around. I didn't show all you people, I'm sorry. I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> all right. Eva watches the moon disappear behind the clouds as she walks, excited to see where it will appear again. How many grains of sand are in the whole world, Mama? I wonder about that, too. There are trillions and trillions of grains of sand, but nobody knows exactly how many. Eva tries to think about all the sand in the whole world. It feels so big that I can't fit it all in my imagination. It makes me feel dizzy, like I'm falling. I know what you mean, her mother agrees, and I'm sure other people feel that way too. Look at Eva and her mother walking along the ocean. Ocean, there you go. All right. Eva walks down another path looking at the moon and a strange little butterfly appears. Can you see the butterfly? 
You could see if you were closer. <laughs> there you go. See the butterfly? Whoops. There you go. Okay. Then she notices there are butterflies everywhere. Mama, where did all these butterflies come from? These butterflies have been flying around for a few days, but they started out as little caterpillars, and those caterpillars came from eggs, and those eggs came from other butterflies. There are cycles all around us with one thing ending and another beginning. Things are always changing. Can you think of other things that change? Look at that plane with all those butterflies. Butterflies, butterflies. Okay. Hmm, clouds and frogs. And what else changes? Me. Okay. Look, oh, that looks like so much fun. They're swinging around on the grass. Doesn't that look beautiful? Later, Eva wonders, Mama, what was here before all the butterflies and frogs and clouds, before everything? I don't know, answers her mother. It's another mystery. I like trying to imagine what was here before the beginning of everything. What do you think was here? And Eva says, smiling, I don't know. She thinks about it for a long time, and then she has an idea. I wonder if there were feelings. Did you see the picture? Isn't that a pretty picture? Wow, very nice. As she walks home, Eva sees the moon again, glowing brightly above the roof of her house. Let's go inside and look, through the, look for the moon through the window. And they're pointing to a little sliver of the moon. Did you see that? Yes, OK, good. We live with some big mysteries. When we come upon one, we're given a little gift. Every mystery is something for all of us to wonder about together. What do you wonder about? Okay. Let us now sing the children to their classes. Number 414. Ready? We leave this This is a time to share our joys and sorrows. If you wish to let us know something that has moved you deeply and you're here at the fellowship, in a moment you may either come to the front or speak from your seat, raising your hand for a microphone. If you're at home, you can write your joy or sorrow in the chat and Joe will read them. Let's honor this time to share our personal experiences rather than to give announcements. If you prefer to express your joy or sorrow silently, you may drop a stone into the bowl at the side of the, right here on the side, or after the service. Now please come forward to speak or raise your hand to have a microphone brought to you. Good morning. 
Um, I'm Elaine, and um, I uh, just want to share a joy that I feel very humble by. I just came back from um, three weeks in Patagonia, both Chilean and Argentinian sides, and uh, some part of Brazil also. Um, sometimes I wonder about how amazing our planet is and how much we take it for granted and all the other beings on it, including the lichen that broke up the soil and the rocks that we depend on to live on and to move on land. So I'm so grateful for the experience and, um, and I guess that's, it really humbles me because I know that before I came along there were many, many other people that have come and live and depend on that land and sadly I didn't see many of them and there were many things that, <laughs> that I saw that overrode their existence, but I still was able to be able to explore and find a little bit of, you know, of the pre-Columbian pre kind of uh, artifacts and the people and the culture and, um, and the amazing, um, you know, ecologies and land that they depended on and nurture and honor. So I would learn that from them and continue to do it. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, I have a sorrow. Um, a very, a good friend of mine, Robert Duran, um, is coming home for hospice. Um, he's got two weeks now. Um, Robert is amazing. Um, he's diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer four times. Okay, over the course of, I don't know how many, like five years, every time he would get bad news, I, there's, he never said anything. Uh, he was always positive. I have never heard him feel sorry for himself or feel sorry for his family. He's got two young kids. He's a lot younger than me. Um, he's loved in our neighborhood. He would go for cancer, he have his cancer treatment, and then get on his bike and go for 15 miles. So I'd mountain bike with him and stuff. He, um, his story has been on the news a whole bunch of times. You, he's pancreatic cancer, he's got a whole cause and stuff. Um, and um, he's gonna be missed, um, and he fought every single step of the way. It's complete and utter inspiration to me and all of us in our neighborhood. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Louise. And of course, I usually speak about something. I had a great weekend, plays, concerts, demonstrations. And we've got a luncheon today that is going to be out of this world. And at the thrift shop where I volunteer at, I found a piece of high-tech kitchen equipment. I am so excited to get this high-tech piece of kitchen equipment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda, and I'm just moved by how many people have come forward to volunteer and participate in the organic garden that we're just about almost ready to plant, but not quite, but we're preparing the area and getting people together. So anyway, I was just really moved by how many people came forward. Good morning, I'm Lucy. Um, I just, I have a sorrow and a, a gratefulness, I think. I, um, a close friend, he's like a father, another father to me, and um, he has advanced Parkinson's. And it's kind of a, a shocking force of will that he's lived as long as he has and with the amount of disability that he has. It's kind of, it's a testament to the force of life. Um, but it's, he's on hospice care now, and, um, and he's really, he's tired. Um, but, you know, I'm so grateful that he's in my life, and um, that, you know, I've been able to be in his because I'm like a grandchild or a niece. Like, he can talk to me about things he can't talk to his kids about, because I'm close enough, but just far enough away. 
and um, he's a vet and my dad was a vet and he can talk to me about stuff that is difficult. But I'm also, I want to say, you know, he was a corpsman and so he understands when they want to do heroic intervention. You know, he's an old man and he's dying and he knows it and they like, let's do this. And he says, well, then what are you going to do? Then what are you going to do? Then and it's that thing where like, at some point you have to stop. And that he said, I will absolutely not be intubated because he knows once that happens, you lose all control. And he, he signed himself out of the ICU. And he said, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die at home with my family. He has a big, loving family, which I'm grateful for. He's not in a home. And I'm just really grateful that we live in a state where people can do that. Because, you know, I'm, I am a card-carrying member of the Hemlock Society when they used to have cards. And, you know, I believe that we have a divine right to say when enough is enough. And, and we live in a place where someone can say, I will not be intubated, and I'm leaving now. And that the hospital and his family respected that. And nobody said, no, no. And um, that he's where he wants to be. And he will pass as he chooses to, as in, you know, he's been a grown up since he was 17, so that he's able to do that in his own place and his, the time he chooses. So I'm really grateful for that. We should all be so lucky. Anyone else? Hello, those of the, you who have known me for a long time know that I used to have a girlfriend, Deb, who we were real serious together. And uh, just the marking of time, it's been 15 years since she went hiking by herself and never came home. I have um, both a sorrow and a joy, and that is that my, um, I have a foster niece who's 22, she's my Hannah's age, and she um, has a baby, and um, lived in many hot foster homes growing up, but was, was, was with my sister and brother-in-law when she was a teenager, um, and has recently escaped from a very abusive relationship, and, um, and knew that our family was always a home for her, and she's, she has come home to, to our family, and um, and is um, an inspiration to me. She's thriving, she's doing really great, and um, I just, I would love any prayers for her that she can continue going on this path that she's on right now um, with the love of my sister and brother-in-law, so thanks. Joe, do we have any from the chat? No? So let us just hold in our hearts the joys and the sorrows that have been expressed this morning. And also those that didn't make it into words that continue to reside quietly in your hearts and in your minds. May our joys be amplified and our sorrows diminish by sharing with each other. I got my teeth, I got my neck, I got my tits. 
Discipline not getting up and dancing to that song. That was great. I was having a hard time. Excellent, excellent. All right, so now we're to the offering. And the offering that we make each Sunday isn't just a stale habit, it's an opportunity to recommit to this place and to us, all of us. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something we value. With our gifts given freely, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation. The ushers will be passing the baskets. Whether you are here or participating via the internet, you can make an offering using Breeze. The connection is on our website, uufsd.org. Thank you very much for whatever you can contribute. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you.
Let us now enter into a time of silence for meditation, reflection, or prayer by first singing the chant, Meditation on Breathing. The time of silence will end with the sound of Katie's piano. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hoovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into evening all you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing, this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around? I have been working as a hospital chaplain for about a year and a half now. And one of the things I love about my job is the opportunity I am given to meet people truly from all walks of life. And going from room to room, I may encounter a veteran, a philosopher, a homeless person, a homemaker, someone's child, someone's parent, grandparents, and people of all different faith backgrounds and of no faith at all. It is such a gift to see humans being humans in their both unique and collective ways. As a chaplain, my goal is to accompany people as they grapple with a new diagnosis, as they recover from an illness, or as they prepare to leave the world or to say goodbye to a loved one. I don't have an agenda when I walk into a room. Instead, I allow their story, their sharing to shape the course of our time together. But often, I carry two questions with me. The first one, I wonder how I would respond if I were going through the same thing. And the second question, 
what does this person's experience and story tell me about being human? Now, the other thing about working in a hospital is that the focus of everything is around the body. The doctors and nurses talk about patients in terms of their medical needs, their diagnosis and prognosis. Chaplains, or better said, this chaplain knows nothing about the medical needs of a patient. My focus is then on how the challenges their bodies face are impacting their inner life and also how their inner resources can help them cope with their physical challenges. So this practice of constantly navigating the relationship between the inner life of a person and their physical needs or the physical expression of their spiritual distress is what led me to bring this conversation to you, this wondering to you. We know we live in a society that places more value on reason, the use of the mind, than on feelings. Yet, feelings are. Being human in its most basic understanding means being embodied in a vessel of flesh and bones, a vessel with which we experience the world in both unique and collective ways. Our bodies are constantly collecting information from our surroundings, even before we can make sense of them. By the time we are able to name an emotion, an experience, or an object, several processes have taken place inside of us. Now, most of my patients struggle with their emotions and with their feelings. They struggle because they think they should be able to control what they feel or how they feel. They stress over not being able to be the strong person they thought they were, and they feel guilty when they find themselves crying and vulnerable or struggling to contain their emotions. Bodies feel, and bodies feel all the time. Not all of the things we feel will turn into a strong emotion, but our bodies are sensing the world all the time. Our brains receive an overwhelming amount of information that our bodies receive and turn it into information that help us act, behave, and be, and to be in social environments like ours. Now, you probably heard the phrase that bodies regenerate every seven years. Well, it's not like a deadline where cells all of the sudden are like, okay, our time's up, time for new ones, and then boom, all of your old cells are replaced by new ones. But what it means is that different parts of your body have a different timelines for cells replacing. For some, it may take a few days. For others, months, and for others, years. But now think of this as the fact that your body is constantly participating in the co-creation of itself. Isn't that fascinating? And as we heard in the story today about this girl wondering about the world she sees, I allow, allow yourself to be amazed by the fact that within you, there's a whole world, both physical and metaphysical, that is worthy of awe, that is mysterious and often unperceivable. In the words of Mark Nepo, or Nepo, you are the only explorer, your heart, the unreadable compass, your soul, the shore of a promise too great to be ignored. And I understand Mark Nepo's use of the word soul as that immense world within that each person carries. My doctor once sent me to get an abdominal ultrasound. And as a technician moved around the area, my doctor indicating, she turned something on and I heard a loud whoosh. It caught me by surprise. And before I could ask, she said, nothing to worry, it's just, just blood, you know, blood flow. And then, but at that moment, I understood that I had rivers flowing inside of me. And then I thought about my own heartbeat and about the many other sounds inside my body that I cannot hear. It was wonderful to realize that my body was not quiet or silent as I like to think when I meditate or when I invite people to tap into the silence within. The miracle was my ability to hear then to understand what was being said to me, and finally the processes that took place in my brain that brought me awareness of the moment and the happenings 
inside and outside of me. In his book, The Feelings of What Happens, neuroscientist Antonio Damasio explores the connection between body, emotion, and consciousness. And he writes, after considering how consciousness may be produced within the three pounds of flesh we call brain, we may revere life and respect human beings more rather than less. He also states that sometimes we use our mind not to discover facts, but to hide them. And that the body is one of those things our mind can hide best because otherwise, he says, we would know that emotions and feelings are tangibly about the body. So what I want to really advocate for is for the knowledge of the body. And I acknowledge that pain, illness, and trauma can make inhabiting our bodies a difficult task. Yet, even so, our actions are still influenced by the sensations of our bodies. Take, for instance, the moments when you walk into a room and you feel something's off or you feel a sense of peace, or think about when you fell in love with someone and you were overtaken by all that you experienced at the moment. We experience sensations and emotions and we label them, but what goes on in our bodies remains a mystery for many of us. Re recently, I came across a video that showed what happiness really looks like. The description of the video by John Lever reads, this is what a kinesin protein might look like. Molecules of the protein myosin drag a ball of endorphins along an active filament into the inner part of the brain's parietal cortex, which produces feelings of happiness. So now, as science continues to advance and explore more the inner workings of our brains, especially when it relates and how it relates to the emotions we experience, we are both given answers and moments of awe and are also left with questions and the task of making sense of what this means for us. So I think, you know, when I think about being human, I, th I think about being this embodied awareness. I am referring to the ability that we have to know that we are experiencing something. As much as living in our heads may be our preferred way of existence or how we learn to move through the world, our bodies, the sensations and emotions they experience are closely tied to how we interpret them and how this interpretation influences our being in the world. So let me go back to my story about meeting patients. When I ask myself, what does this person's experience tell me about being human? I am inviting myself to stop any judgment, any preconceived ideas I may have, and to instead hold space for the uniqueness of the person to show up. Because you see, I am convinced that each of us, that each person has a unique path to follow, and that the direction they follow, to follow the path can only come from their own compasses if they tune in with it enough to listen to it. So while living in our heads has given us the wonderful gifts of civilization, not allowing ourselves to be in tune with how our bodies move and exist in the world will leave us with incomplete perceptions. There are some many things that we humans have been able to achieve, knowledge and discoveries about the world we live in, but we are still surrounded by mystery. I wonder how we may be different in how we understand ourselves and one another if we brought curiosity to the forefront. When I ask, what does this person experience tell me about being human? I am not seeking a definite answer. I already know I can't find it. I am inviting and stretching the boundaries of what I think being human is so that it can be more inclusive and more expansive. Whenever I feel that I had answers or guidance to give to people, I have found out that what I was given was the answers and guidance that had worked in my path, in my own journey the only journey I truly know. But if I'll hold space and invite questions, I have seen how beautiful the teacher within each person emerges and gives them the answers they are seeking. And I learn in the process, because as I hear people come up with their own answers, ones that are different from my own, I am given the opportunity to remember that there are many ways to be in the world. 
We live in a world of chaos that we strive to make sense of. We sometimes, and some of us more often than not, experience our own inner chaos. And when we find ourselves in those spaces of confusion and uncertainty, we do our best to make sense of that inner chaos too. But because we are only aware of our own inner process, many of us tend to think that the others have it easy, resolved. And yes, if you add the complex systems that humans create and that are often oppressive, we know that the struggles of some are already more than others. But I also think that this awareness can help us relate to one another with more care and compassion. Repeating the words of Dr. Antonio Damasio, after considering how consciousness may be produced within the three pounds of flesh we call brain, we may revere life and respect human beings more rather than less. The condition of being human is the condition of living in a vessel of flesh with complex, mysterious processes that are not fully known to us, but that impact us on a daily basis. Being human is also the ongoing and questioning and struggle to find exactly what and who we are and to understand life. Being human is about our relationships with others, with the world. Being human is about the active and the unconscious acts that co-create the world and about returning to the, reality, to the reality of being after all bodies that feel, that sense, and that try to make sense of the world of narrative, stories, knowledge, curiosity, delight, savoring, movement, building, and thinking. William Stafford reminds us, what can anyone give you greater than now? He reminds us at the end, our bodies always only exist in the present moment, when life happens outside of them and also within them at the same time. So being human is also about a mind that has the capacity to think in the past tense or to plan for the future in a body that exists only in the now. With all the unknowns that still surround our existence, I invite you to consider that being human is not the condition of being born, but our life vocation. That being human is a becoming, a journey, a process of discovery, rediscovery, co-creation, of leaning into the experience of life fully, of wondering about the world outside, the world within, and the vast and individual worlds that keep us company, that sit next to us at church or at the dinner table. That being human is the condition of loving life, loving the world with all of its uncertainty, with all of its unanswered questions, with all of the heartbreak, with the conviction to help heal others, with the understanding that the mystery behind it all may never be revealed to us, but yet it calls us over and over again to love and to the experience of being both the lover but also the beloved. Now I invite you to join me in our closing hymn just as long as I have breath, number six.
please join me in the words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts, and we are together again. You may be seated. And I can use some help turning off the chalice. Take from this past hour what will serve you well, a word, a smile, a thought, the warmth of this community. Let it accompany you and remind you that you are not alone on this journey, on knowing the world, on wondering about life. With gratitude for our time together this morning, may you be blessed, may you be safe, may you be at peace. Amen. The service has ended. Please stay and listen to the beautiful postlude by Katie. <laughs>